Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 3, The House of Burgundy. In today's episode, we will look at the Capetian House of Burgundy, which ruled the duchy from the 1030s to 1361 and set the stage for the Valois. While this episode's pace won't be quite as breakneck as last episode, and a little bit more geographically focused, I still plan on covering about 300 years in this one. So, without further ado, on with the show. We ended last episode with the Capetian king, Robert II, annexing Burgundy into the royal domain. But what was the royal domain? To really grasp this concept, a concept that will pop up on occasion over the course of our series, we should go slightly back in time to the rise of Hugh Capet. We saw how the Robertonians competed with the Carolingians for power in West Francia, and how, when not holding the monarchy outright, they worked to increase their power in land holdings. Well, last week I focused on Hugh the Great's title of Duke of Burgundy, he also held a more important title, Dux Francorum, or Duke of France. This title essentially made him the second man in West Francia, and if you place preeminence on political connections, possibly the first. When Hugh the Great died, the title Dux Francorum passed to his son, Hugh Capet. The lands associated with this title were less than those with Dux Burgundiorum, or Duke of Burgundy, but they did include Paris, Orléans, and some lands between them, as well as many other towns and locales in the area. However, more important than the lands themselves was the prestige of the title and the familial power of the Robertonians. This familial power grew alongside the rise of feudalism. During the Viking raids, the central imperial courts seemed unable to turn back the Northmen, so the people facing the brunt of the northern onslaught turned more and more to their local lords for protection. While land was generally seen as the medium in which feudalism existed, the protection offered by lords and their armies was its reason for being. As the local lords offered more effective, even if not perfect, protection from the Vikings, their power and influence grew, while the power and influence of the central Carolingian government waned. So when the Carolingian king, Louis V, died without issue in 987, Hugh parlayed his influence with the nobles to be elected king. There was still a Carolingian prince alive, Louis' uncle Charles, the Duke of Lower Lotharingia, but it seemed that the West Frankish nobles were done being vassals of the Carolingians in general, and with Charles' antics in particular, and there was little support for his bid for the throne. So it was that the Carolingians lost control of Francia. Henry the Fowler's rise to king of the Eastern Franks in 919 had put an end to Carolingian rule there, and Hugh Capet's ascension marked the end of Carolingian dominance. Although the family still ruled over Lotharingia, now mostly known as Lorraine, they had lost power over most of the empire they had founded, and the family would soon die out in Lorraine as well. That being said, the Carolingians were not completely gone. Hugh Capet was a cousin of the family, and most of the high nobles in both East and West Francia were connected to the Carolingians somehow. But the main Carolingian line did go the way of the dinosaurs. But back to Hugh. Despite being one of the more powerful nobles in France, his election was due as much to his weakness as it was to his strength. The nobles of France did not want a strong king who could impose his will upon them, and Hugh's relatively meager personal holdings meant that, in order to enforce his will, he would have to call upon the service of his vassals. This also meant that Hugh didn't have the means to overpower his strongest vassals, and focused mostly on expanding his personal holdings, now the royal domain, on the edges of the territory that he already held. The job of truly expanding the royal domain was left to Hugh's son, Robert II. Shortly after his election as king, Hugh Capet spent most of his remaining political capital to get Robert elected a king as well. Although many of the high nobles seemed wary of this move as it was the first step in establishing a hereditary dynasty, the relatively weak position of Hugh allowed him to get away with it. Although it should be noted that from Hugh Capet until Philip Augustus, all Capetian kings would have their sons raised to the throne during their lifetime, a process that would firmly establish hereditary succession over electoral. The rise of hereditary succession, in the case of Burgundy as the transformation of Duke from a beneficiary title to a hereditary one, came shortly after the death of Robert II. During his lifetime, Robert had given the Duchy of Burgundy to his second son, Henry, but Henry's older brother died and he ended up on the throne, much to the chagrin of his younger brother, Robert. 
Robert and Henry had spent the last few years of their father's reign in revolt, and Robert very much intended on keeping his misbehavior up. So, in order to pacify his little brother, Henry gave him the Duchy of Burgundy. The gift was both incredibly generous and really not much at all. The gift was generous as Burgundy was given to Robert and his heirs. In short, Burgundy was given to Robert as a hereditary duchy. However, at this point, the office of Duke of Burgundy did not come with any land. This meant that just like the Capetian kings, the office of the Capetian Dukes of Burgundy, at least at the beginning, was more held in the chain of feudal command than in the ability to exercise real power. And just like the power of the kings was held back by the power and independent urges of counts and dukes, the power of those same counts and dukes was held back by the lords they sat above in the feudal hierarchy. And without personally held land in the duchy, Robert did not have the ability to truly command his lords. But the story of the Capetian House of Burgundy would mirror that of the Capetian royal house. Patiently, and over time, the dukes would build up their personal holdings. Both branches of the Capetian house would make use of the law of uscit, or the right of the lord to take over property when one of their vassals died without an heir, to great effect. The Capetians also grew their influence by purchasing both land and vassals. While the former is simple enough to grasp, the latter requires some getting into. Although feudalism is generally a hierarchy, there were a not insignificant amount of landholders, both large and small, that did not pay homage to anyone. The process of creating vassals where they did not exist before could occur in a number of ways. Sometimes it could simply be demanded by a powerful lord. Sometimes it involved a gift of another fief in exchange for paying homage for an independent one. And as the years passed, sometimes the lord of an independent fief would begin to pay homage to the duke simply because all of his neighbors were doing it, or to avoid paying homage to a smaller but closer lord. As the House of Burgundy grew their holdings, they also began to be able to further exercise their power. For the most part, all the methods of acquiring land and vassals cost money, so where did they get it? Robert became infamous for the plunder of the lands of his own vassals, as well as those belonging to the church in Burgundy. And while this method of raising funds is effective in the short term, it does not a stable dynasty make. So his successors generally turned to more amenable fundraising methods. These methods included the collection of feudal dues, taking out loans, and the sale of feudal rights. The rights sold could range from the right to collect tolls over a bridge to the right to be immune from certain types of feudal justice and much more. Another right that was sold was the right to form communes. This was sold to towns and gave them a degree of self-governance, and the relationship between the communes and the nobility will be a topic that is often returned to especially as the Valois Dukes of Burgundy gained control of the very urbanized, at least for the late Middle Ages, County of Flanders. When Robert died, he left Burgundy to his grandson Hugh, but Hugh would only reign as Duke for three years before leaving the office to become a monk at Cluny. So, let us take a moment to discuss the monastic revolution that Burgundy was at the center of. Last episode, I mentioned the rise of monasticism. What had initially been holy men going into the proverbial desert in the model of Anthony of Egypt had, over the centuries, morphed into little communities dotting the countryside. Monasteries would be founded by nobles hoping to ensure the state of their souls, and other nobles would grant land over to monasteries for the same reasons. In short, the monasteries grew very wealthy and powerful, and that wealth and power was seen as a corrupting influence by many critics of medieval Christianity. Of course, monasteries were not the only aspects of the medieval church that this criticism was leveled against, and the monastic reform movement should be seen as a single aspect of the reforms that culminated in the Gregorian papal reform movement and the investiture conflict between the papacy and the German emperors. But that is out of the scope of our podcast. If you are interested in this topic, and it is a very interesting one, there are many podcasts that do cover it quite well, including the History of the Germans podcast. In 910, the Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Macon donated his hunting retreat in Burgundy to the church to found a new abbey. This donation was much more than a mere house in a patch of forest. It included fields, woods, vineyards, and serfs to work them. Unlike most of the donations at that time, in this case, the Duke formally gave up all authority and rights that he had over the land, and only asked that he and his family be prayed for by the monks. In fact, although he may have not legally been able to do so, the duke proclaimed that the abbey was outside the jurisdiction of all temporal lords and, in the ecclesiastical realm, was only answerable to the pope. 
This wide grant of independence, combined with the early abbots of Cluny's enthusiasm for monastic reform, made Cluny the center of the monastic reform movement. The Cluniac ideology was based upon a much stricter adherence to the rules of St. Benedict, which had lost its teeth over the centuries. The dependence of most monasteries to their local lord, who would often retire to them, caused, in many people's eyes, a secular influence that was detrimental to the spiritual work of the abbey. Cluny's independence thus let it adhere to the rule of St. Benedict without worrying that a retiring patron would demand special treatment. This revitalization of the monastic way of life was alluring to many, and soon daughter houses sprung up all across Western Christendom. The daughter house system was another thing that made Cluny special. It was fairly common for a group of monks to leave one abbey and found another, but in the past these abbeys would often have nothing more than the personal ties of the members to bind them together. The Cluny daughter houses, whether founded by Cluniac monks or former independent monasteries that chose to join Cluny, were officially under the control of the main abbey, and the heads of the daughter houses were considered administrators rather than leaders. But despite the subservience, joining the Cluniac network allowed for the monastery to gain the privileges of independence from lords and the rest of the church that the mother house held, which was a tempting deal to make. But Cluny's success began to cause problems for it. One of the core values of the rule of St. Benedict was the expectation that all monks perform manual labor to maintain the monastery. This work included maintaining the buildings and farming the land. And while the labor was useful to the monastery, it also served to ground the monks in the world, and the combination of prayer and work was central to the monastic experience. Cluny's monks instead devoted all their time to prayer, and outsourced the physical labor to lay people. As Cluny's influence grew, the resources they drew on also grew, and the abbey became the richest in Europe. Just as Cluny was founded in reaction to the problems with monasticism in the 900s, the late 1100s would see a handful of monks from a Cluniac monastery leave the order they felt had lost its way and found an abbey at Citeaux, near Dijon, in Burgundy. The Cistercians, as their order became known, wanted to go back to a more faithful interpretation of the rule of St. Benedict. They returned to the combination of work and prayer and focused on denying themselves, a part of the rule that was often relaxed as monasteries grew more wealthy. The Cistercian reform, like the Cluniac reform, was tempting to many, and soon many daughter houses sprung up. The Dukes of Burgundy were generally important supporters of the Cistercian movement and made a number of donations to it. Many of the early daughter houses would be in Burgundy. The first and most famous of these daughter houses was also in Burgundy, the Abbey of Clairvaux. The daughter houses of the Cistercian movement were not mere appendages of the mother house like with Cluny. Each abbey was independent, and every year the abbots of the Cistercian monasteries would meet at Citeaux to decide on the direction to take the order and to manage its affairs. The only direct control that the abbot of Citeaux had over these meetings was the right to make a decision when the body as a whole could not agree on one. The Cistercians replaced the Cluniacs as the preeminent monastic movement in Western Christendom around 50 years after the founding of the abbey at Citeaux, largely due to the influence of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. However, by the time that the Valois dukes gained power in Burgundy, the momentum of religious reform and influence had passed to the mendicant orders. The monasteries of Cluny, Citeaux, and their daughter houses were not abandoned overnight, and some still exist to this day, but they were no longer leading lights of the church. Cluny and the Cistercians may have been victims of their own success. As they grew and acquired more followers, they became wealthier and more influential. The mother houses grew rich, and it became almost impossible to control the lax practice of their interpretations of the rule of St. Benedict when the orders had so many monasteries to deal with, and the leaders, surrounded by wealth and its corrupting influence, became walking contradictions. Both religious orders would go through periods of reform and resurgence as their leaders did their best to breathe new life into each, but the tide of history had moved on from Cluny and Citeaux. However, when Hugh left the ducal office to join Cluny in 1079, the order was still going strong and had not yet reached the height of its influence. The presence of the centers of these orders gave Burgundy an esteemed place within Western Christendom. Burgundy saw pilgrims and religious seekers from all over Europe, and the prestige of these religious houses added to the prestige of the dukes. Even if the power of these houses limited the power of the dukes in some aspects, the Capetian House of Burgundy was willing to appease the religious orders if it meant that they were home to some of the most important sites in Christendom. Speaking of medieval Christianity, Burgundy was also the home of a sizable contingent of crusaders over the years, especially supporting the second and third. 
And while I won't take much time today to cover crusading, I'll get more into it when I talk about the Crusade of Nicopolis, which was led by one of our four principal dukes. For the most part, it is important to understand that the main aspect of the Crusades was to export violence from Western Europe. As the Carolingian Empire split up, the lords of especially the western half began feuding like crazy. Generally, this was on a local level, with the feuds getting more intense as the pieces of land being fought over got smaller and closer together, but the feuding could be seen on all levels of the feudal hierarchy. This feuding was paired with a general collapse of central authority that Hugh Capet and his successors fought hard against. But essentially, as feudalism spread and lords were splitting their lands between multiple heirs, the local lord became poorer and more willing to go to war over their neighbor's castle, forest, fields, bridges, or vineyards, and there was little royal or even ducal authority over their heads there to stop them. This, of course, also led to blood feuds, where after an initial round of violence, families became sworn enemies, causing unceasing hostilities between them and their vassals. Needless to say, all this feuding was not good for the peasants, just trying to make it through to another harvest. The feuding was also bad for the church, and so in the late 900s, the Peace of God movement began. This movement, which went through multiple iterations of pieces and truces over time, was an attempt by the church, with large support from many secular rulers, to limit the feuding that took hold of West Francia. Cluny and its daughter houses were some of the most influential supporters of the peace and truce of God, and Robert II of France, who waged much war throughout his reign to increase his holdings, including Burgundy, was also a big supporter of the movement. But the truces could only limit the violence boiling in France so much. The Crusades ended up being a powerful outlet for it. There is an interesting parallel between France's growing stability in being able to export its violence in the Crusades and its much later enthusiastic participation in colonialism, another way that the country grew in power and stability through the export of violence. That being said, not all the violence channeled through the Crusades was exported. The Albigensian Crusade in the early 1200s was a brutal sweep through Languedoc in southern France which did much to increase the power of the French crown. But I digress. For now it's important to note that the ideas of chivalry and its quasi-religious idea of righteous violence have many roots in both the Peace of God movements and in the Crusades. And for those of you looking ahead, the ideals of chivalry will be at the forefront of many of the Valois Dukes of Burgundy, especially Philip the Good. Another reason that I wanted to at least mention the Crusades is that the infamous Fourth Crusade carries with it a status upgrade to the Dukes of Burgundy. After the sack of Constantinople and the brief dissolution of the Byzantine Empire, one of the successor kingdoms created by the Latin Crusaders was the Kingdom of Thessalonica. And while the kingdom itself only lasted for about 20 years, the title of King of Thessalonica was sold a few times before landing with the Dukes of Burgundy, who held it for a little over 50 years. This title meant very little in practice, but it did bring with it much prestige. The second Duke of Burgundy to hold the title King of Thessalonica is the next individual I'd like to bring up. Robert II, Duke of Burgundy and King of Thessalonica, did not accomplish much in his lifetime. He dutifully continued the family tradition of slowly increasing the amount of land and vassals personally held by the ducal office, but his biggest contribution to the Burgundian state building project happened with his death. Robert II did away with the practice of splitting up the duchy among all his sons and left, quote, all the fiefs, former fiefs, seigneuries, and revenue belonging to the duchy to his oldest son, Hugh. This move towards primogeniture succession over the older Salic succession did much to accelerate the growth of the power of the Dukes of Burgundy, as now the lands that a duke had spent his life accumulating would not be split up again upon his death. It would be under Odo IV, a younger son of Robert II, that Burgundy really began to show its splendor, and the reign of Odo IV can be seen as a precursor to those of the Valois Dukes. He had firm control over his vassals, he magnified his splendor by being a great patron of the arts, and he used political marriages deftly to increase his power and influence. He tied his branch of the Capetian family back to the senior branch with one sister, and later tied it to the new Valois royal family with another. But perhaps the best match that he made was his own. His wife Joan III was the daughter of King Philip V of France, and more importantly, Joan II of Burgundy. No, the other Burgundy. Joan, through her mother, had received the counties of Burgundy and Artois, the county just southeast of Flanders. Joan held these possessions in her own right, but the husband and wife ruled both as a united force. 
and going forward in our story, we will see many women act as powerful countesses. Odo's marriage to Joan married the two Burgundies, and represented in many ways the epilogue of the war between Robert II of France and Otto William of Burgundy. While the county of Burgundy was not truly united with the duchy, and was part of the Holy Roman Empire rather than France, the process of united the two Burgundies had begun. Although Odo never held the same level of personal control over the county as he did the duchy, he and his wife planted seeds that would be cultivated a generation later. The county of Artois was no less a gift for Odo. While it was not quite as wealthy as its neighbor Flanders, Artois was a relatively urbanized area for the time and was home to a great amount of commerce. The acquisition of Artois marks the first steps that the Dukes of Burgundy would take towards the Low Countries. But marriage was not the only method that Odo used to acquire territory. He continued to expand the personal holdings of the Duke and expand the reach of the ducal government. As the development of the state apparatus is of interest to me and will feature greatly in our story to come, let's take a look at what it looked like under the Capetian House of Burgundy. Like in all things, the House of Burgundy modeled their government after their cousin's royal government. The Jours Généraux was the Burgundian equivalent of the Parlement, which was a combination law court and royal, or in our case, ducal, council. In Burgundy, the Jours Généraux was centered on Bonn in southern Burgundy. The dukes also imitated the royal appointment of bailiffs and seneschals to represent their interests on a more local scale, and five bayages divided up the duchy. The ducal bailiffs were central figures in the growth of ducal power. They were professional administrators rather than just the son of some noble, and carried both a deep knowledge of jurisprudence and the power of ducal authority. Ducal bailiffs were not unique to Burgundy, but in Burgundy they were used exceptionally effectively. The most important job of the bailiff was to ensure that the rights of the duke were protected as much as possible, and that the revenue that those rights granted was exploited as efficiently and as much as possible. The presence of these bailiffs throughout the duchy did much to unify the collection of lords and lands that owed their homage to the duke. Towards the second half of the reign of the House of Burgundy, these rights stopped including taxes on Italian merchants traveling north to the great fairs of medieval France, as they were granted ducal exceptions. And while the loss of income may not have been ideal, the relationship between the Dukes of Burgundy and the merchants of Italy would only grow in importance. As Odo was building up his state, the larger French state was rocked by crisis. The royal Capetian line had died out and the Valois were now kings of France. Odo may have initially been unhappy with the change of royal family, but he soon married his sister to the new king, Philip, and was ever after a loyal vassal to his brother-in-law. However, the English royal family had their own claim on the French throne, and were not so quick to offer their vassalage for their continental holdings. After years of rising tension, the Hundred Years' War broke out. The Hundred Years' War is a topic for another episode, or several, as the conflict rises and falls throughout the rule of the Valois Dukes of Burgundy, and they will be central figures in many of its chapters. But let's look at how the Hundred Years' War affected the Capetian Burgundians. Odo spent the first years of the conflict loyally serving Philip. Due to its proximity to England, the county of Artois quickly became a front line in the conflict, and Odo spent many years fighting there, as well as all around France in many of the great battles of the early years. Unfortunately for Odo, England would besiege and take Calais, a key strategic port in Artois. Calais would remain in English hands for over 200 years, and the seizure of it increased tensions between Odo and Philip. As Artois was now home to an English foothold on the continent, the royal government was focused more and more on Artois as a centerpiece of the war effort. Slowly, royal officials began to disregard comital ones, and Philip later appointed his own officials, disregarding Odo's governance of Artois completely. In 1346, Philip completely disbanded the comital government and began to exert direct royal authority over the county. This authority would not last forever, but it would outlive Odo, who died in 1350. Odo had the misfortune of outliving his son, so the two Burgundies and Artois would fall to his three-year-old grandson, Philip of Rouve. However, it will be a bit before we get to Philip. Next episode, we will cover the history of Flanders and urbanization in the Middle Ages, and after that we will dive deeper into the origins of the Hundred Years' War. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it five stars on your platform of choice and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me on twitter.com slash Burgundy or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com.